So Anna, we're here for the GRDC in conversation Woo-hoo. podcast. <laughs> Millie was telling me a little bit about your property and the area that you guys farm here. So I'd love to know a little bit about that if you'd share with us where we are. So we're just west of Wee War. Uh, we're two kilometres from the town levee, so we're not very far at all. Um, we have a, a very small irrigated um, farm here. Uh, it's all on black soil, pretty much all developed uh, for irrigation. So yeah, this year we have uh, cotton in the ground, but um, we haven't had cotton for a couple of years. We uh, had canola the last, not last winter season, winter season before. That was an interesting harvest. We had to harvest in between flood peaks, which was um, pretty unex- unexciting. I mean, very exciting at the time, but, you know, I, I look back and go, oh, my gosh, that was a bit stressful. On top um, of other things, logistical oh, yeah, nightmare. Just, you know, yeah, trying to get, get it out and beat rainfall events and in between flood peaks. It was interesting harvest. And prior to that, we'd had a mix of canola and maize in. And reason to go into cotton this year? What was that? Um, we'd had enough of a break um, from cotton. Uh, we don't like to grow cotton every year. So yeah, we have a break and we use corn actually as a good break and also winter winter crops as well. So we wore as a town, what's it famous for, for us out of towners? Uh, for you out of towners, it was, it's the oldest town on the Nemoy. Uh, we wore the name means uh, uh, fire for cooking. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is, uh, the, uh, they, it claims to be the birthplace of cotton in Australia. Uh, it was certainly one of the areas that developed cotton very early and irrigation. I probably should s- stop saying cotton, but developed into irrigation very early in the piece. And certainly the Hadley and Carl family have, there's been a lot of press around them over the previous decade about their involvement in getting the irrigation systems up and running for cotton. Can you give us a little spark notes version of that? Like how, how was the area developed by them? I think, well, they came over from uh, the United States and uh, they used their skills from there to, you know, bring the variety, the cotton varieties in, develop gins, bring the technology over, I guess, to farm um, uh, in furrow irrigation. So I'm not really all over it, to be honest, but um, it's of- certainly... It's, I'm certainly very thankful for that coming to Australia because I've made a, a, a nice career out of it. Absolutely. And I, I think, well, I'm really interested to, to chat to you about biologicals and everything else, but I think mm-hmm. up front we probably need to address that this is the first brother-sister combination we've had on the GRDC <laughs> podcast. Yay, Marky. Yeah. <laughs> um, you listen to his episode because you've got the, the privilege of being able to critique now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not going to critique him at all. And uh, I know he, I don't know whether he will or me either. Um, yeah, no, Mark and I um, both came from grazing background of all things. I studied ag. Uh, oh, I'm actually quite a bit older than my brother. <laughs> um, so, yeah, sorry. I, I'll, I'll lead the way. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how did you end up? Like down this pathway, obviously working now in agronomy, but also farming yourself. Yeah. Um, so I, I obviously went to uni. I was really fortunate to get a really good scholarship to go to uni and I studied agriculture. I studied rural science and I knew from year seven at school, that's exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to study rural science and go into agriculture because that's what I knew. I grew up in, uh, around the Trangy Narromine district. I went to Narromine High School. I spent every day with my father and grandfather on the farm. So I, and you know, I guess you love what you do at the time. If you're that sort of person, if you're a glass half full person, which I think to be a farmer and and in agriculture, you really need to be a glass half full person. Otherwise you wouldn't do it. Being that glass half full person, I decided in year seven, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to study agriculture. I wanted to do rural science at the University of New England. And that is exactly what I did. I managed to get a really good scholarship to be able to enable me to do that. At university, in the first six weeks, a Professor Wal Whaley came into our lecture theatre and gave us a lecture on how we were going to feed the world with the amount of a very small amount of agricultural land that we had with the growing population, with all of the, I guess, the growth of population, how that was going to happen. And it was really interesting. I went to university to get into the livestock industry. And as soon as I came out of that university lecture, I went, knock on your, nowhere near uh, did I think that we were going to feed the world with animal protein. So I switched and went, I think I want to go into agronomy. 
And that's what I did. Now, I was really fortunate that the scholarship I got was with a corporate ag company called Oscott. And they had always said to me, if you want a summer job, come and see us in about June, July, and we'll see what we can do. I did that. And I crop scouted for them for three years. Uh, When I came out of university, there was no jobs available with them, but I had already been offered three jobs in cotton industry come straight out of uni. So I went straight into the first job I was offered, obviously, yeah, wow. <laughs> in the middle of a drought. I went and worked for a plant breeder and that was a great experience. I loved working for that. Picked up my one of my mentors who was the Australian vice president of that company. I only worked for them for six months, but he always, whenever he saw me, had took me under his wing and looked after me and really helped develop me. He gave me more than money. And I will always say, then I've said this to his family, you're you, I, to, I, I, you know, I've worked for his, his family ever since, or for a, a long time. And I've always said, your father gave me more than money. He gave me the confidence and ability to make my own money. And I will be forever grateful for that. So that was my first job. It was um, not my favorite job. Then I went into retail agronomy and I got the skills to be able to start my own company. So I uh, left that company after four years and started my own company called Swift Agriculture. Can I ask, so that that first job, the, Mm -hmm. the skills that he gave you more than money, like what was it? Was he like, what, what kind of boss was he for you? Well, he actually wasn't my direct boss. Believe it or not, he was the vice president of the company, but whenever he saw me, he would just talk to me, chat to me about cotton and, you know, his experience. And he'd ask me lots of questions and he'd help me out when I needed that help. Um, he actually wasn't my boss. So, like, he, uh, he just, he just, I think he noted a kindred spirit in me. And I was really fortunate just before he died. He said, I really need someone to drive me for half a day. Will you do it? And I got to thank him. And he got to tell me lots and lots of stuff about himself that I'm really fortunate to have, to have discovered outside of agriculture. That's so cool. Is mm-hmm. Even more than a mentorship, it sounds like a true friendship as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I want to jump back to to the kid in year seven. Mm-hmm. Was there any any stage like I, I think it's interesting that you say that like yeah you didn't get drawn away from from agriculture, and I've chatted to a few different people and they say you either get born into it or you kind of come across it and once it's in your blood it never leaves. Mm-hmm. Did you ever think or yeah consider doing anything differently? Well, before that, I wanted to be a hairdresser. Okay. And um, up until I was seven, I wanted to be a jockey. And um, by that stage, I was taller than my grandmother, who was four foot ten. And she said, look, Angie, because that's what she used to call me, you're way too tall to be a jockey now. You're going to have to do something else. <laughs> so, um, no, not really. No, not really. And But there are days when I go, oh, my God, surely I could have picked something a lot easier than what I do now. But you know what? At the same time, I really just love it. And, look, I grew up in a family, and Mark will tell you this, my brother, um, there were no girls and boys. There were just people and everyone did everything. So I guess growing up in a situation where there was not that gender, oh, you're a girl, you need to go to the house and do whatever they do in the house. There was the, come on, you'll be right. Go on, wrestle that sheep and bring it over here. And, you know, we'll, you know, go, you know, go and catch that fly blown sheep or, you know, start that irrigation pipe. There was never any... You know, I I think because w- w- there was no issues with confidence with me, and I think that's that was part of that whole introduction into agriculture. Was I knew I could do everything that I needed to do. Yeah. So that university lecturer, it mm-hmm. it, it seems like a lot of those conversations that were being had in the nineties probably are still pretty oh, prominent absolutely. today. <laughs> absolutely, they're worse. I think they're getting more dominant because we're moving away from that conventional chemical and conventional type of style of farming to a more sustainable, friendly sort of type of farming. I think there is a little bit of a divide in the perception of agriculture and what actually goes on. But in some ways, that's good. In other ways, it's not so good. There's some very strict regulations that are coming on. You think, oh my gosh, you know, that's, we don't even do that. Well, why are we being regulated for that? I guess in other ways, it's making us think of alternative ways to do things that are better. And that's what we need to be in agriculture. We always need to be striving to be better. And do you think there's a, a real mind shift change happening 
in the sector or for the sector at the moment? Or, or do you think we're still lagging behind a little bit in terms of where maybe society's moving? Oh, absolutely. Innovation in agriculture is incredible. There's so much innovation in agriculture and it happens at a really rapid pace. Different sectors of agriculture adopt their um, innovation and technology at different rates. And certainly the cotton industry, which I'm, you know, part of, is a very rapid adopter of new technology. I think there are some statistics about 14 months or something, but, um, you know, I won't say that because I don't know where that came from. But yeah, we are doing things a lot better and we're measuring a lot more. Uh, I think some of the issues that we're having is that we're actually doing better, but we're perceived as not doing better. Um, you know, there's always that doubt of, oh, you know, you know, really? Is that what they're doing? Or is that just what they're making up? You know, that, that, that really mistrust. Mm. And I think that's a really big societal issue is that we're not out there, you know, trying to make things worse. We're actually out there trying to make our farm sustainable and profitable and to be able to hand that on to the next generation. We're not trying to just mine it. Um, I think the problem is with primary production is that we're all lumped into one big basket and miners do mine. In agriculture, we tend to sustain and I think there's a big dis there's a, probably a little bit of a misrepresentation of what we actually do. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah. And I think it's because people, I think it's from a point of fear as well of like, oh, if people know what happens, maybe they'll stop us from doing it. But I don't actually think it will happen. I think, um, yeah, there's, there's a couple of things. You know, in Australia, we, we certainly work on a threat basis. So is there a threat in Europe where they work on a risk basis? Like, oh, my God, that's a risk. We'll just stop it. And because it's such a vocal community, um, the EU, I think that uh, some of that probably filters into the vernacular of our community. And I think that is a little unfair. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your business today and how long have you been running it for and okay so um, who's involved in it well I stopped uh I when my husband and I got engaged we I closed down we were only engaged for a very short time and we got married I had the longest shotgun wet a shotgun pregnancy ever <laughs> um so <laughs> I we just decided to get married before the cotton season so we got we weren't engaged for very long and I shut down we you know it didn't seem to make sense to have two sets of accounts, two sets of books, you know, two businesses. So when we did the same thing, we're both ag consultants. So we've been uh, running the business together since 2001. Were you competitors before? No. Okay. No, no, no. We worked with each other. So for the first year, actually, we um, were two different companies, but we, I would go and help Steve and Steve would come and help me. So no, always work together. Yeah, so I shut that business down in 2001 and Madden Agriculture became it. Um, we do a range of broadacre crops, irrigated and, and rain grown. So I, we check both, both types, summer and winter, uh, grain, fibre, oil seeds. Yeah, the whole, whole, whole shebang. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, occasionally I'll get pulled in to go and look at pastures or something even as equally exciting. <laughs> what's your, your, what's your true passion like in and around agronomy? Um, my true passion or my, um, I guess my philosophy and what I aim for is to make my growers as profitable as possible because I want to see them there next year. It's not about me getting as much as I can out of them. No. And, um, if one of my growers is watching this, he'll laugh when I, he hears this. <laughs> <laughs> talking to someone specifically? <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, but, yeah, so I, instead of going ahead with something that I don't think is profitable, I will always be up front. So I guess my, my philosophy is to treat everyone else's crops as if they're mine, mm -hmm. um, to do the best for them and to, be, to have them as profitable and as sustainable as possible. And I think that would be pretty well received by them, wouldn't it? I hope so. I hope so. Do you find it hard, like step, stepping away, like from work, like, mm, if, if you are truly that passionate? Yeah, about I do. It? I do. I am a workaholic. Yeah, absolutely. And and what about though, like as an agronomist, in terms of your spheres of control, like you can you can provide the advice to a point, but it you could work also with be... a grower, you don't work against them. 
Yeah. So if you something's not working for your grower, you work with them. That's that's the bottom line. Like, don't get frustrated. Work with them because it's at the end of the day, they pay the bills. And at the end of the day, what I say is a recommendation. It's not a demand. So work with the grower. It's all about communication. That's the biggest thing. And I'm happy to listen to a grower and their philosophies as long as they're in turn respectful enough to stop and listen to what I've got to say as well if I feel really passionate about it. If it's a line ball decision, let it go. Have you got a, a key moment or like a learning across your career that has really probably shaped, shaped especially I think that philosophy of working with the growers and, and providing recommendations as opposed to demands? Uh, no, no. No, I think I walked into agronomy when I was I was with a company that was associated with elders and at the agronomy conferences, I was the single female in the room for a long time. I certainly wasn't a glass ceiling breaker. No way. There are women that came well before me. One of the people I really admire so much is Christine Campbell, who was the, the um, she, she was the head of Twynham for quite a, quite a while. And she's someone I look, looked up to as a child and then as a young agronomist as well. I guess coming into agronomy as a young, as a young woman, I had to learn the skills to be able to convince people that I knew what I was talking about. And it was all about communication and working with people and not pretending to know everything because I still don't. Yeah. I mean, I'm 51. I don't know everything. I'm still learning. And as my greatest mentor always said to me, I've only got one year's experience. I've had that one year's experience 40 times, but I've only got one year's experience to draw from. So on that, like overcoming that barrier, like at quite a transformational point in, I guess, agriculture, like in 92 was when women were allowed to list themselves as, as farmers. That was my first year, uh, second year at uni. Yeah. <laughs> so like that, that convincing, like... Obviously, there was support from previous bosses and others, but still you had to make your own kind of headway as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I did have support of bosses and I'm sure there were times when they would get phone calls saying, what do you hell? <laughs> no, you can say, well, whatever, say whatever you like. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Sending Anyway, look, I'm sure that happened, but I'm not going to let that. So I guess with my upbringing and that confidence I was given as a child, knowing that I could do whatever anyone else could do, um, you know, I could pull a calf down in the, in the yards. I could, you know, I could pull a ram out for the shearers. I could do all of that. Like, you know, there was no, oh, you better not do that. You're a bit, you know, <laughs> get in there and do it. Um, so I guess that attitude, I took that attitude with me into my, into the workplace, wherever I went. If you tell me I can't do something, I will prove you wrong more often than not. So, um, I, to my detriment that, and I don't think that's a good trait to have. I'd say though, in running your own business, it, it, that dogged determination is pretty important. Absolutely. The dogged determination is the, uh, never say, tell me I can't do anything. It's yeah. probably not a good thing. When's it caught you out? Oh, I just, you know, I work probably too long hours. <laughs> As in just uh, complete overcommit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the inability to say no. Yeah. So let's then, you're saying you're not a, a glass ceiling breaker, but for, no, God, for no. women in agriculture, you're, you're incredibly passionate about supporting Absolutely. women and, and creating pathways and opportunities to develop them. Well, and even not even so much that. Those, those pathways are there. The opportunities are all there. Keeping women in agriculture and that's a, providing a support framework to keep girls and females in the, the ag sector and to lo stop losing all of that brain power when they might think that there's other things that, you know, that they need to do. If we can... I see a lot of girls that are really passionate about ag, but well, how do I do it all? Let's provide the framework for that. Let's help those women think of things that are slightly outside the box. I mean, my parents didn't live on the farm. We didn't have a farm when my kids were born. We lived in Wee War. Um, my parents lived three and a half hours to five hours away. They moved in that period. And my husband's family lived three hours away. We didn't have a family close by to help us. We just made it work. 
How, how did you, like, did you keep working through? Uh, yeah, I did. Um, I did definitely slow down, uh, for a little while. Uh, we did have a nanny for a couple of years. We did have a nanny for a couple of years. Um, when we were really, really busy and it made more sense to employ someone to help with the children in the household than to actually employ someone else who wasn't exper- as experienced or wasn't as passionate or committed to the business. Um, so yeah, we did do that. I guess the ki- the, ki- the kids have just got used to being in the car with me when they were little and coming to work. And <laughs> it's quite funny because some of the cl- growers now go, oh, miss seeing your kids in the car. <laughs> <laughs> Will any of your kids follow in your footsteps? No. None? No. Okay. No. No, no, they, um, I don't think so much that. I think we have given them the opportunity to go and to, to create passions for themselves rather than create those passions for them. And do you think that's slightly easier, like being in a rural community but not having the, like solely being on the farm? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Um. Oh, actually, no, probably not. I really enjoy farm life. I grew up on a farm. Um, but I, that's me. That probably isn't everyone. But, yeah, that's that's different. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's an interesting one. And, I mean, when we, um, you know, the boys didn't go to school at the local high school. They went to a school away from here. And um, when we were looking at the school, one of the things that I really had in the back of my mind is that, you know, they need to go and experience other things outside of agriculture. So they didn't go to a country boarding school. Yeah. That's fair enough, I think. Mm. If the opportunity was there to be farming full-time, do you think you do it or do you love the, the spice of variety? Oh, I don't know. When I don't farm, I miss it. When I don't consult, I absolutely miss it. So <laughs> I don't know. I, that's a hard question because I re- and I think that's the um, disadvantage of never being able to say no. See, that there is a downfall. Yeah. Of, yeah. So I think if, you know, I mean, there will come a time when I'll have to give it all up, obviously, you know, my body won't go forever. But yeah, I, look, I really love the mental stimulation of agricultural consulting. And a lot of people go in and go, oh my God, I hate this. It's, you do the same thing a hundred times every day. And I go, but I see something different every time I walk into a field. It's never all the same. Every crop is different. And I think it's that eye for detail and that, that being able to note the change that I'm really passionate about. And that gives me mental stimulation. So I think I'd miss both of them if I couldn't do either. It's interesting you say that because it was literally, I've had a bit of a drive to get here, 14 hours. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was thinking that as I was driving past the paddocks, I was like, yes, I have farm as a, a farming, a crop a year. Yeah. But actually it, there's so much variety and so much nuance in different land types, the different. Absolutely. Yeah. What, what can happen here compared to 5K as well. It's so different. Like it's. It's interesting you say that. My, um, one of my uni friends, really good close uni friends is from Tasmania in a beautiful part of Tasmania where it's hilly and it's, you know, it's idyllic <laughs> sheep farm. And she came to visit me out at Trangy, which is completely flat. And she said, how do you live out here? It's so boring. Yeah. And I went, righto. Okay. You're going to learn a little bit about landscape right now. And I showed her the differences in the vegetation versus soil type versus elevation. And when she saw that, she went, you know, I would never have seen that had you not told me that. How do you know that? And I said, well, I grew up here and I also had a grandfather that was really interested in teaching us about nature and landscape. And a great country. That, has that, would you say that the nature side of things is a real fundamental piece in your interest in agriculture? Yes and no. Biodiversity, I love that whole biodiversity, but I work in a monocultural system. Um, we can bring biodiversity into the monoculture. And I started in the bad old days of cotton where, you know, we were spraying heliothes constantly and resistance and all of those types of things. I started my career in the cotton industry, the first year in guard cotton um, was being introduced into the Australian, you know, system. So I've gone from, you know, the conventional days right through to bot- now, what we now have, Bolgard 3, and, you know, in te- in, within te- the next 10 years, we'll probably have Bolgard 4 and put potentially other insecticidal and herbicidal traits. So I think what that 
has done for me as in development is allowed me to look at the biodiversity within this monocultural system and how that works and how we can make things a little bit better and a little bit more sustainable. Yeah. And um, well, it's something that I'm, I guess it's the part that fascinates me about ag and, mm -hmm. and it's that, that balance between what was said to you in that uni lecture of mm -hmm. the need to feed people, but in the same time, it's this this management of the natural environment, the ecosystems and everything that happens absolutely in and around the paddocks actually has flow-ons far more broadly. Absolutely. You know, what we see out in our stock roots, the vegetation there, when that, when that dries up, all of a sudden we get a whole new population of, um, you know, m mammal, birds and insects into our crops. So we have to manage that to at our best ability, but most sustainably. And you're right, it is that real balance about with the environment and production. And I think that as people in ag, we're getting a lot better, but I think there's a lag in that perception of what we are actually doing. We're not out there killing everything like we used to in the field. We're out there trying to manage and maintain what we've got. And I know there's, you know, people say, oh, you know, you're putting this on and you're killing all the weeds and what's that doing? But yet, what are we doing by turning that soil over and killing the microbes? There's a real, you know, I think there's a great lack of understanding and knowledge around the general, from the general population about what we do and how we do it and how we can do it better and what we are currently doing to make it better. Um, for example, and I'm sure you'll talk to Steve more about this, we actually put insects into the field um, to enhance what we will get. So in a normal situation, the pest numbers will rise really um, quickly and then the prey or the predator will come in afterwards. What we do is we put the prey and the predator when the pest numbers are low into the field and that keeps the pest low so that we are reducing our, um, our footprint by reducing the amount of insecticide or whatever else we ne might need to apply to control that pest. And so that's the, the term biologicals that you... Yeah, so I, get, I guess so. And biologicals is not really um, associated in Australia with broadacre cropping. It's more, it, it, it is really, really limited to horticultural and greenhouse systems because it's small. And in most, and even in Europe, because um, I, I got a lot of questions about this when I was at a conference in Switzerland how do you get farmers to spend money they don't even know if they've got a, you know, problem for? And I said, well, it's easy because it's cheaper than having to spray at the end of the day. So even in Australia, in the horticultural system, it's a reactive system. It's not a proactive system. We, we look at things a little bit differently. We're proactively trying to control that pest before it becomes a problem. Um, rather than a reactive situation in a horticulture, you know, say in a greenhouse, when you know, oh, we've got a thrip problem, let's get some predatory trip some whites or, you know, oris in there and control them. Yeah, we're doing that before we have a problem. Yeah, so, gotcha. Yeah. Can, so for the uneducated person like me, because when you said biologicals the other day, I was thinking probably what I've heard more of on, I'll say in ag news, ag media around biologicals has been, yeah, live seed coatings to help draw carbon down and things. Is there a broader definition which explains to... Well, I guess, um, so in our situation, we're talking about a biological control of insects. Mm -hmm. um, there's other biologicals when um, at that same conference, I was learning about funguses that you add to the soil that are parasites of the pest funguses, and they reduce the amount of fungus in a, in a say, a potato crop. There's other biological, you know, uh, herbicides, there's biological insecticides, there's funguses that we can put out, there's viruses that we're putting out that are actually a live virus that kills only this Lepidopteran pest. Incredible. So, yeah, they're, they're, you know, there's lots of things we do and it's quite common practice in sorghum to do that. So tell me about some of the travels. I know you went to Europe last year, but what have, what have the the different areas and, and, and the travels exposed you to around agriculture and, and maybe comparatively where we're at versus other parts well, of the world? Well, it's really interesting. I spent a little bit of time with an agronomist in Italy last year. Um, she worked in floriculture and I learned that farmers are universally all the same. 
They have the same questions. They have the same arguments. They all have the same, they, they really, there's really no difference. You know, you have the guys that are really passionate. So she worked for a company um, called Bioplanet in Italy and they provide insects to, like what we do, but to treat pest insects such as mealybugs or uh, whitefly, which is what we, we do in Australia with the Hayati. They use a different a group of insects to do that. Um, you know, there's the guys over there that are, you know, they've got the old gear and they're really passionate about this biologicals because they think that's the future. And, you know, they've seen the bad old ways and they, they're going really well. And then you've got this big corporate who's got, you know, 80 hectares of glass houses and no, we just don't want any pests so we'll just spray. But, you know, they will have a dabble in the biologicals. Um, so what I learned spending time um, with Martina in Italy is that universally farmers are all the same. They all have their little nuances and quirks and they're all very passionate about their products um, and they want the best, um, but they all have their own way. And, and that's great. And it's all about communication and it's about how to deal, you know, with that, that system, but they all want to do the best they can and be the most profitable and sustainable they can be. They just do it in different ways. I guess um, certainly I didn't get to look at the broad acre systems over there to see how the, um, the climate and what have you is really important. But certainly in at the, one of the conferences that I was at, I learned about the corn borer being, becoming resistant to nearly everything. And, you know, so every, universally, we all have the same problems. They're just different specific problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's about overcoming those problems. And um, was she doing anything differently in terms of how she was approaching it or was it? Yeah. No, it's, it's actually, um, the other girl that was with me who has seen me at work before said, it's just like watching you at work. And it was <laughs> in Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Will you try and get her out here? Um, I would love to have Martina come and visit, not to work, just to come and visit and, and, and show her. I, I've kept in contact with her. In fact, at Christmas, on Christmas day, we were swapping messages and videos and well wishes. So okay. yeah, yeah. She's quite a lot younger than me. <laughs> But I, yeah, I just, I really would love to have her over and say, look, you know, it is possible to do this and keep going. Because I think as females in ag worldwide, we can help each other. And, you know, if we can build each other up, we're mm. so much stronger together. Stop fighting each other. Just build it together and really encourage it. Because I think it's a great, great opportunity. And I met a lot of really great, beautiful agronomists in the floriculture greenhouses that were just amazing women. I couldn't speak to a couple of them because I can't speak Italian and they couldn't speak English. <laughs> you need to Google Translate. But yeah, that's what we did. That's, yeah, right. that's exactly how we did it. But really, I really, one of the girls I would really love to catch up with again. She was a really fantastic lady. So why did, why did you head over there? Was there a specific reason or something you were looking to um, get your head around? So we went over, and Steve will talk to you about Crop Capsules. Um, so the Crop Capsules company were the finalists in an innovation award in Europe. Um, gotcha. And um, so we went over to the conference that all of the, um, that, yeah, that award was presented at. So it was part of the International um, Bio, Biological Control Manufacturers Association um, we went to their conference, their annual conference, and it was fantastic. I met people from all over the world. I saw some amazing developments, met some amazing people. You know, it, it was really incredible, the amount of CEO owners of these big companies that I actually met over there. Um, it was incredible. So, yeah, it was um, and very small, um, very small conference, mm -hmm. but and really personable, but it was just really a great conference to go to. I, um, I didn't, I went to a couple of the, the presentations, but I really got out of it just walking around the, the trade displays and talking to people about what they're doing differently and, you know, what we might, what I thought that we might be able to come back to Australia with. And it certainly, yeah, it was a really good experience. Yeah, eye cool. opener. It was an eye opener. Every second display was a consultant on registration in the EU uh, for biologicals because it is becoming, you know, their cap on 
imports is getting closer and closer and closer, although I did see, see a few weeks ago that they'd extended glyphosate for 10 years, which, of course, you know, everyone's up in arms about in Europe, but that's probably good for us in Australia with our MRLs going into the European market. So I've got a couple of questions. One, just going back to what you said before about like the different types of farmers. And, and it's probably a very dumb question, but something that you've made me think about here. So the, the different types of farmers we have globally, early adopters, call them laggards, the corporates, like the different ways of farming. Like, is there a reason why there's not more people just doing it the way that the top 20% do it? Absolutely. There's so many reasons. Like, there's not one. Well, and like, I guess, yeah, like what are those, those reasons? Like, and I think it's, so what makes me think about it is when you look at say industry bodies and whatnot, and it's their representative of everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, every, everyone ends up being grouped as agriculture and those different. And you know what? They're not any different to each other as far as how good they are at what they do. They're all as good as one another. They just have different attitudes and different risk levels of risk management. You know, some people can't afford to be the early adopters because what if it fails? Mm. You know, not everyone has the funding to do that. They need to know that this they're going to kick a goal out of this year. Some people it's just a matter of, well, you know, I've already always done it this way and it's worked and I don't need to. I'm comfortable with where I am. It's a comfort level as well. Mm. So I think there's a whole separate layers of where you're talking, you're talking about where's my risk profile, where's my comfort profile, where's my care factor profile. Mm -hmm. And not any one of those people lumped in agriculture are any better or any worse than any other. They're all great at what they do. If they weren't, agriculture's not business that they need to be in and most of them sell up. So, and, you know, we need corporates in ag. We need that investment to make us better and to become innovators. So I, I think the, that the um, kickback and flack that a lot of the bigger corporates or even the small family farmers get, it's really unwarranted. We need the whole range mm. of people in agriculture to get the best out of agriculture and to actually get that innovation to where we need it to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, look, agriculture is so exciting. Um, you know, anyone who's watching this, listening to this, <laughs> um, who wants to come into an industry that's really exciting, ag is the way to go. Yeah. I don't care whether you're, you know, where you're from, you know, whether you're male or female, um, oh. whether, you know, whether you're old, you know, it's never too late. You know, we're not ageist in agriculture. We're all old. Um, <laughs> So, you know, months not old. Oh, you yeah, know. <laughs> um, look, it, it is so exciting. I took some of my son's friends to the cotton conference. They'd um, duck into cotton. I said, come on, boys. Well, go on. I'm going to show you what, what you're missing out on here. One wanted to be an engineer. One wants to be a merchant banker. I can't remember. Oh, the uh, okay, well, engineer. It was engineer and merchant banker, and there was another one with us, and he had no interest in agriculture whatsoever. But we ended up finding somewhere for him to fit. The engineer came with me, and he goes, "Oh my god, I could go into agriculture tomorrow!" Like I showed him what we do with the you know capsules. I showed him the big machinery, mm. the the probe, the moisture probes, and all the innovation that was there. And he's like, "Oh, my god, this is so funny." He was from Melbourne. He'd never had any agricultural experiences apart from, you know, meeting the boys at school and going out to their farms. Jack, who wants to be a merchant banker, he's like, oh, my God, money is it's really unbelievable. You know, he could see the potential for him in agriculture and in investment. And so this really is a place for everyone in agriculture. We certainly need physios and dentists and everyone to come out and support our ag industries and have a great time and move to these little towns that it can be so vibrant if we have great communities around us. So look, for anyone who thinks, oh, well, you know, that's a bit scary, no, 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 come and visit us. We're really nice people. Well, and I think that's part of the social fabric, isn't it? You've got... Absolutely. And as I was driving through Finlay yesterday on the way up, I've got a, a few good mates that live there. Yeah. I've played a couple of games of footy and it's, there's... Well, I don't even know if we're allowed to say it, and it's my podcast. No, but there was the, the local drunk who was just sitting yeah. down up the street, but 
everyone says good night. Yeah. yeah. Everyone, and, he, and he's a friendly fella. And then, yeah, there's there's the corporates, there's the nurses, there's the teachers, there's all these different people that we actually need that yeah. really, I think, are, I see them as part of being part of agriculture because they are so important to the community and the community wouldn't exist and ag wouldn't thrive without all the ancillary, ancillary people but, involved. But we can't forget the people in the the deli owners. They're part of our agricultural industry as well. They're selling what we produce and they're really passionate about what they sell. Yeah. So they're really passionate about what we produce. So a great example of that was my sister lived in Art Almond and I went into this little local deli she lived there. and she went in there most days and the men would say, hello, what can I get you? And she'd say, oh, hello, I'll have. Anyway, I walked in and went, hey, how's your day? I'm really well. It's been going great. Thanks for asking. And we got chatting and he wanted to be an olive farmer. There you go. And my sister walked out, she goes, Oh my God, I've been going in there for years and he's not ever spoken to me once. I said, well, you know what? It's the country way. You've just got to remember what you grew up with. Um, but that is a great example of someone right in the city who's a part of agriculture and doesn't even realise it. Mm. The, the local produce manager at Woolworths in Hornsby, they're part of agriculture too because they're, they're displaying proudly what we're producing um so for those people in the cities who go oh my god this they're all part of it yeah. everyone is part of it because we all eat we all wear clothes you've nailed the, the definition really of what a human of agriculture is and what we're yeah. trying to do it's it's anyone who's mate who's passionate about the decisions they make at their little point wherever that is Absolutely. And it's really, really important that people realise that, you know, don't stop and think, you know, are we, are those people doing something that's really, you know, that, you know, you might think or perceive it's being bad, but what do you really know about it? Mm. Because you're part of the agricultural spectrum too. You're wearing that cotton, those cotton onions, you know, you've got that cotton shirt, t-shirt on, you know, that's the cotton, um, you know, traceable Australian cotton country road t-shirt or dress or whatever you're wearing or jeans. Um, you know, you've been to cotton on and it's BCI cotton. You've got that beautiful woolen jumper from where, wherever, North Face, I don't care, wherever, that's been, you know, sustainably, you know, as, as sustainably as possibly produced for you to wear. Um, you're eating really healthy fresh food, whether that's the fried chips at the local chippo, you know, the cottonseed oil came from somewhere and those potatoes were probably grown somewhere in Australia by a farmer who's really passionate to give you the best, most sustainable product possible. So for you, what is it that makes you passionate and why do you do what you do? Because I always want to be better. I always do better. That's why I'm passionate because it's all about the positive. It's that half full glass that I have. Hopefully one day it'll tip over. (laughs) (laughs) And so then why is agriculture the vehicle that you're choosing to have your impact through? Don't ask me that. I'm going to tell you because it's what I know. It is what I know. And I'd probably be passionate about that growing beautiful green grass. That's what I I knew. And that's what I did. Or, you know, being the best possible lawyer or doctor or dentist or whatever it was. I'm, I'm just that sort of person. And ag's what I know. And that's what I'm passionate about. Yeah, cool. Oh, sorry. No, that's, <laughs> that's a, not a very good answer. It isn't. Well, I think it is a great answer. No, it's, I, I think it's really boring. It actually really does show a great lack of imagination on my behalf. <laughs> As one of my um, dad's best friend's mothers used to say, oh, darling, you're so lucky, you know, you can travel. I had lack of imagination. I married the boy next door. <laughs> <laughs> A few still, districts away. I still laugh at, <laughs> at that that saying from my dad's best friend's mum, who I had a great relationship with. So, well, let's let's spark your imagination. A couple of quick fire questions. Mm-hmm. Um, it's this is the GRDC in conversation podcast. So, mm-hmm. what's your favourite grain based dish? Mm. Oh, well, that's a really hard one because there's so many of them. I really love it. It's really good fermented pizza base that I've just learned to cook from coming back in Italy. And um, some beautiful pastas that we ate over there. But, of course, you know, I can't go past a nice risotto or even really good corn chip. Freshly oh, yeah. made corn chips are. Add that to the bucket list. Mm-hmm. 
So who would be three people that if you could have anyone past, present, uh, around for dinner, we say for freshly, <laughs> freshly made corn chips, <laughs> who would you have? Um, both my grandfathers. Mm-hmm. And a third? That's a really horribly hard question. I can't actually pick one because there's, I've got so many great people in my life and I want to have all <laughs> around. So you're having a party instead. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you know what? Actually, I lied. I'd have all my grandparents back for dinner and I could, I don't know which one I could drop, possibly drop out because you know what? They were such a great influence. They all had agricultural backgrounds. They were all incredible people, whether that be with academic, whether that be their business acumen, whether it be you know, just being the you know head of the local Red Cross, you know. Um, one of my grandmothers who would always say, I'm so under, you know, whatever. Some of the stories that I've heard about her and what she did are just incredible. So I, I'm sorry, it's all my grandparents. So I'm sorry. Um, we'll judge I would all. just have to, um, <laughs> I would just have to stand up around around the table and be the server. Yeah. <laughs> you just drop on the conversation. I'd be the, I'd be the waitress. Okay. What's something on your bucket list? Something on my bucket list. Oh, do you know what I've always wanted to do? Is do a cattle drive in the snowy mountain. Oh, yeah. You know what, Mom? I'll just throw it in here as well. I was thinking about it over Christmas. I'd love to do dog sledding in Alaska. Oh, oh that'd be really good. I, it just popped up on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was I'm, like, I couldn't do that. <laughs> I'm dying to go. So we, we took a train, fast train through Tuscany and Umbria, and I'm dying to go and stay on a farm yep. and get to know a farming family. There. I did that in Wales when I was in my 20s. I went to and stayed at the Young Welsh, head of the Young Welsh Farmers Association's farm. And I milked cows at four o'clock in the morning and four o'clock at night. So two dark milkings because it was winter. <laughs> and I got to know this family and they were just beautiful. And I want to do that in, I want to do that in a lot of countries. Yeah. That's the first one I want to go to because it's so beautiful. That is cool. Mm-hmm. Were you able to speak the same language as them or is it? Oh, they spoke Gaelic. Okay. Um, when they didn't want me to know what they were talking about, but, and, and, you know, they, they, that was their first language, obviously, but they, no, I could speak, they, they all spoke English. They'd been to boarding school, <laughs> part of, so, um, you know, that was really good. That was really fun. And so one final question, if there was a, a I'll say a type of person or mm-hmm. someone in particular that you think is someone who we should really chat to, mm-hmm. have you got someone in mind or, or a type of person in mind? Yeah, actually I do, but I'm not going to say it on, on, um, I'm going to tell you privately later because I'm not going to put her out there. Okay. Um, actually there's two of them and I think they would be really good, but one in particular, I think would be fantastic. Uh, she's, she's a real, she's someone that I look up to and she's quite a bit younger than me. Well, that's cool. Mm. Can I ask, so without giving it away, what is it about it? What are the characteristics that make her so remarkable? The fact that she walked into something that she probably, that no one expected her to do, that she came from a very traditional family, yet she's doing, she's gone into something that would be probably perceived as not the norm. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think that she's the start of potentially this sort of thing happening more often, and I really want her to see her succeed so that more families do succession planning like this. Cryptic. Mm-hmm. I'm intrigued. Well, Anna, thank you so much for joining us and having a chat. Hopefully yeah, you've thanks. enjoyed it. It's great. Thank you so much, Ollie. It's been great to sit here in your backyard. Oh, it's lovely here, isn't it? I need to get the boys onto this uh, tiling job that they haven't done yet. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.